When the Buddha explains the first noble truth, one of the examples he gives is not getting what you want. That's suffering. Now the common response to that is, well, just grab what you want and then you would suffer. But when the Buddha explains what he means by that statement, you realize it's not something you can grab. He says, for people subject to aging, wanting not to age. People subject to illness, wanting not to grow ill. People subject to death, not wanting to die. As he says, these things are not to be gained by, by wanting. Now some other people hear that and they feel, well, just learn to accept these things. Learn how not to want, and they'll be okay. But this is also not what the Buddha taught. After all, he didn't teach just one noble truth, he taught four. There is suffering, which is the clinging. And there's a cause to the suffering, craving. Three types of craving in particular, all of which lead to becoming, the process by which you take on an identity in a world of experience. But it is possible to put an end to that cause. That's what the third noble truth is all about. You can develop dispassion for those cravings. And when there's dispassion for them, the cravings stop, and that's the end of suffering. And the way to do that is through the path, starting with right view and ending in right concentration. So the Buddha is not saying not to want. He's basically saying, want these things, want to be free from aging, illness, and death. But learn how to do it in a skillful way. Think of the young prince who became the Buddha. That was his desire, to find an end to these things. But he realized you couldn't just wish these things away. And then as he became Buddha, he realized that aging, illness, and death will happen. But it's possible to learn how not to suffer from them. And then more than that, it's possible to find a deathless realm in which these things don't happen again, in which you will not be subject to them. That's why the path is not simply learning not to have desires, because there are things you've got to do. The path starts with the realization there are skillful thoughts and unskillful thoughts. That's part of what right view tells you. Skillful desires and unskillful desires. And so you learn how to, have to learn how to encourage and nourish the skillful ones and abandon the unskillful ones. This requires that you make distinctions. There are states of concentration where whatever comes up, you just let it go. But those states are useful only at certain points. They can't do all the work. As the Buddha said, there are some causes of suffering that will go away. Simply looking at them, they'll disappear. Others, however, require work. The kind of work they require is interesting because it's the same kind of work that we do all the time, simply that we're doing it in an unskillful way. Because the present moment is not just a matter of things presenting themselves to us, ready-made. If we're to make an analogy, a lot of people think of the present moment as being like a TV show. You have no say in what the TV show is going to show you. It's a question of simply watching it, getting upset by it, or learning how not to get upset. But the way the Buddha describes the present moment, it's more like an interactive game. You play a role in shaping it. There are certain potentials that come in from your past karma, but they're just potentials. His image is of a field planted full of seeds, and certain seeds are beginning to sprout. And it's the seeds that you pay attention to that will sprout first. And the act of paying attention is part of what the Buddha calls fabrication. We take these potentials and we turn them into a present moment experience. And fabrication has three types. There's bodily fabrication, which is your in and out breath, verbal fabrication, which you're but it defines as directed thought and evaluation, which is basically the way you talk to yourself. 
you choose a topic and then you comment on it, ask questions about it, decide what you like and don't like about it, those kinds of things. And then there's mental fabrication, which are perceptions and feelings. Perceptions here are the images you have, the labels you apply to things, identifying this is this and that is that. And feelings are not emotions so much, they're more feeling tones. Feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And there's an intentional element in all of these things. That's why the Buddha calls them fabrications. Which means that every present moment experience has an element of intention. We're in there shaping things. The problem is that we're so unconscious of what we're doing that we tend to shape things in an unskillful way. And we have some old habits that we picked up. Or we're just not paying attention. Or we don't even think that we're doing anything. We think, as most people think, the present moment just comes to them ready-made. And they don't see the extent to which they are shaping it. This is one of the Buddha's great insights, is that prior to sensory experience, which is your old karma coming, there are your intentions, these fabrications that you do. And if you can learn how to do them with knowledge, they become a path, the path to the end of suffering. Which is why I say what we're doing as we meditate is taking the same things we've been doing all along and we learn how to do them skillfully. We learn how to breathe skillfully. We learn how to talk to ourselves skillfully. We learn how to apply perceptions and focus on feelings in a skillful way. As you're meditating right now, you're focused on the breath. But in focusing on the breath, there's already directed thought and evaluation. You're directing your thoughts to the breath. And then the Buddha encourages you to evaluate it. It's not just in, out, in, out, being with whatever comes up. You have to realize that you can change the way you breathe. This is a test case for how you fabricate your present moment experience. You can breathe short, you can breathe deep, you can breathe long, you can breathe shallow, heavy or light, fast or slow. It can have a huge impact on your body and on the mind. And you have the choice to do these things. These are choices that we tend to overlook. We tend to deny ourselves when we're taught that you have to be with whatever breath is coming in. Don't try to change the breath. The Buddha never says that. All of his breath meditation instructions are, are trainings. There are 16 steps in all, and only the first two are simply discerning differences in the breath. But once you discern them, then you train yourself to breathe in a way that feels good throughout the body. You're aware of the whole body. Give rise to a sense of pleasure, a sense of refreshment. Let it fill the body. So you're engaging verb, excuse me, bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, and even mental fabrication, because you have to have a perception in mind what the breath is doing in the body to get the most out of it. We always carry our own mental images around about which muscles of the body are involved in the breath process. If you're breathing in, where do there have to be sensations so we know that the breath is coming in, where it's going out? But it's good to explore other possibilities so you can gain a sense of refreshment from the breath, gain a sense of ease from the breath. Because the breath is going to be a very useful tool to have once you learn its variations. So this is a test case. Is the Buddha right? Can you make differences in the present moment by what you're deciding to do in the present moment? I think about karma. Some things, of course, give their results only over time. Other things give their results immediately. You stick your finger in a fire and it's not going to burn in your next lifetime. It's going to burn right now. You decide to breathe long, well, you can breathe long. You have that within your power. This is an important part of understanding the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha says you have a lot of power in your hands. You're using it to create suffering, but you don't have to. 
you can use it, use it to create a path to the end of suffering. He's showing you the way. So it's not just a path of acceptance. After all, look at those duties with the Four Noble Truths. We chanted the sutta on setting the wheel of Dharma in motion. And sometimes people ask, well, where's the wheel? Well, it's in that passage where the Buddha talks about how he gained light, knowledge, understanding of things he had never seen before. First he identifies what is actual suffering. It's, it's not what you think it is. It's clinging. What is the cause? The cause isn't the economy, it isn't the society. It's coming from within, your cravings. What is a cessation? Well, learning how to end the craving, and end, your dis end your passion for craving. And there's a path, the Eightfold Path. So he gained knowledge into the Four Truths. Then he gained knowledge into the duties appropriate to them. Suffering should be comprehended. Its cause should be abandoned. Its cessation should be realized, and the path should be developed. So there are four different things you can do there. It's not just accept, accept, accept. There are value judgments being made, distinctions being made. Once you make the distinctions, then you know what to do. And then finally, when you completed the duties for all four truths. Okay, then, as the Buddha said, that's when he knew that he'd gained awakening. Now the wheel as a symbol in, in his time had two meanings. One was just that, what we saw just now, where he takes these four truths and the three levels of knowledge, and he goes through each permutation, twelve permutations and all. Here in the West we would call that a table, a list of variables on one side on the top, another list of variables on the other side, down, going down the left, and then there'd be twelve boxes. In those, time, those days they called it a wheel. It just went around all the different permutations. So that's the wheel of the Dharma. The wheel is also a symbol of power. Once you have a wheel on your chariot, you can go anywhere. A king who had a chariot with a wheel could conquer anything. And in the same way, when you have total knowledge of a topic like this, that too is a way of mastering the knowledge, mastering the topic. So when the Buddha set the wheel rolling, it meant the power of his teaching could all extend throughout the world. So pay attention to those duties. They are distinct. You have to make distinctions. What kind of thoughts are worth abandoning, what kind of thoughts are worth developing? Because that's the difference between causing suffering. If you, if you develop the things you should be abandoning, you're going to cause suffering. If you abandon the things you should be developing, you go nowhere. So these are important dualities. I mean, it's why we have four truths. Skillful, unskillful, cause and effect. That gives us four. Years back I was listening to a scholarly monk from Bangkok complain that in a lot of Vipassana traditions they teach that right view is the three characteristics. He said, no, it's the Four Noble Truths. And at first I thought he was being pedantic. But then on reflection I realized he, he'd had an important insight. Because you think the Three characteristics are the view of reality that the Buddha is trying to teach. It teaches you mainly, okay, everything is going to change, everything is stressful, just let go of it. And there are no distinctions being made, there are no duties. You can, you can take those facts and you can say, well, well, how do I let go? Do I just do whatever I want? Do I have no desires at all? On its own. The teaching about the three characteristics is incomplete. But when you use it in the context of the Four Noble Truths, which is what right view is, you begin to realize that there are distinctions, there are duties. 
one of the duties is to develop dispassion for the causes of suffering so that you can let go. And one of the ways of doing that is to see those causes as inconstant, stressful, not self, not worth holding on to, not worth doing, not worth developing. Then ultimately, when you've finished the work, then you let go of everything. That's the meaning of the image of the raft going across the river. You hold on to the raft. You first you make the raft out of what? Twigs, branches, on this side of the river. This is the side of the river, remember, that that's not safe. But you can't wait for the Nibbana yacht to come over and pick you up. You've got to take what you've got. Your breathing, your direct of thought, your evaluation, your perceptions, your feelings. Those are twigs and branches. But you learn how to make them into a raft. And you hold on to the raft as you go across the river. You get to the other side, because that's when you let go. Don't let go before you've gotten to the other side, though. If you let go in the middle of the river, you just get washed away. So as you're meditating, problems come up in the meditation. Ask yourself, okay, where does this problem lie in the Four Noble Truths? Where does it lie with regard to the duties of those Four Noble Truths? And that can give you some idea of what you should be doing. When you keep these four truths in mind, and have a correct understanding of why the Buddha taught that not getting what you want is suffering, and what he means by that, then you're going to be on the right path. <laughs>